Okay, um, uh, and I think we should get started. Um, I'm Yuki Shiraido in the Political Science Department. Uh, before introducing our speaker today, um, I was asked to make several announcements, which is, I think, um, you know, more than usual. Uh, so on October 7, this coming Monday, uh, they, there, are, there is a special lecture by um, Japanese paper makers, Tomomi and Hisashi Kano, um, uh, which is open, uh, the, 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 the special lecture is open to public in the Stamps Print Media Studios in the Art and Architecture Building on North Campus. Um, on October 12th, um, uh, um, a Japanese artist, Mari Katayama, has, uh, uh, excuse me, so on, on October, October 12th, Mari Katayama has a first solo exhibition in the U.S. at the, at the University Museum of Arts. And on October 10th, uh, she, uh, she is giving a talk um, on Thursday, October 10th at the Michigan Theater from 5.10 to 6.30 p.m. Um, and third, uh, next Friday, October 11th, um, there is a panel discussion, uh, crisis in the alliance, tension in the Japan-South Korea relationship and the implications for U.S. foreign policy. Uh, which which takes which takes place from four to six p.m. on the tenth floor of this building. Um, the panel discussion about sort of recent deteriorating relationship between uh, Japan and South Korea, uh, and I hope the discussion will be productive, unlike the discussion between the governments. Um, uh, that's that's it for the announcement. Okay, um, so. Um, so it's 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 my it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Keisuke Ida at the at the University of Tokyo, who is specialized in international political economy, or it's known as IPE. Uh, Professor Ida received his PhD from Harvard University in 1990, and since then he taught at Princeton University, uh, Oyama Gakuin University in Japan. And he started his current position in 2007. Uh, he published in a number of uh, academic journals, including International Organization, Journal, journal of Conflict Resolution, and International Studies Quarterly, which are all uh, top journals in the field of international relations. Uh, he has three monographs in the intersection of IPE and Japanese foreign policy, whose titles are International Monetary Cooperation Among the US, Japan, and Germany, uh, legalization in Japan and uh, Japan's security and economic dependence on China and the United States. Um, on a personal note, actually, uh, Ida Sensei was one of my mentors when I was a master's student in Japan. Uh, and even before that, he taught me the very first class in IPE I took as a senior college student. So, so I'm doubly glad to introduce him here as a as a colleague if it's not too arrogant to say so um uh, so today professor Eder is going to talk about uh, japan and tpp which i believe is a timely matter because of the recent development on the new u.s japan trade agreement so please join me in welcoming professor Eder. thank you Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, and it's always good to see a former student of mine grow up to be a, a very intelligent uh, academic uh, colleague. Um, the um, and I also uh, it's it's my uh, great pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, for Japanese, it's always with trepidation to visit the Detroit area because of our history. <laughs> uh, but so far, uh, and I suppose Detroit and Ann Arbor are not the same, uh, but so far I have received a sort of red carpet welcome, <laughs> and uh, I'm very glad to be here. And uh, thank you for coming 
or in this uh, bad weather. So today I'm going to talk about trade, uh, and I'm sure everybody is interested in U.S.-China trade war or even the recent uh, U.S.-Japan um, trade agreement that was announced uh, just uh, recently. Uh, but when I prepared for this talk, uh, that agreement was still up in the air, so I, <laughs> I couldn't sort of uh, plan to talk about it. So uh, I talk about the history, uh, a little bit of history, and then uh, a very interesting uh, episode, which happened in 2017. Obviously, for, for the U.S., uh, 2016 was a very extraordinary uh, period uh, for trade history, but for us, actually, it was 2017 uh, when a um, very interesting episode uh, happened. That is, Japan, for the f probably the, for the first time in its trade history, uh, exerted a remarkable degree of leadership in a multilateral trade setting. Uh, sometimes known as TPP-11. And so today I'm going to explain how this happened and uh, why this happened uh, to you. Uh, and it's my pleasure to share my thoughts with you. Okay, um, so uh, the um, Japanese foreign economic policy, especially trade policy, used to be known as very, very uh, passive. Um, uh, uh, one of the most prominent scholars uh, of Japanese studies has called Japan a reactive state for this reason. And it's always uh, a challenge for us to see whether this is still true and if it's true, why? Uh, but uh, as I said uh, before, um, this uh, Japanese leadership in TPP-11 seems to go counter to this conventional wisdom. So that's why it's interesting uh, for uh, Japanese studies. Um, and I, I will argue that this was an exception <laughs> rather than the rule. Uh, but still, you know, it's good to know uh, when an ex exception happens. Okay, so the organization of the talk is very, very simple. Uh, I will start with theory uh, about Japanese uh, foreign economic policy or economic diplomacy. And then I'll talk a little bit about the history of Japanese FTA strategy or free trade agreement strategy. Uh, which happened about 20 years ago. Um, then I'll come to the main topic of TPP-11, or the formal name is Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, pretty mouthful, and we all, we all blame Canadians for this name. <laughs> uh, it's too long. <laughs> So it's very hard to pronounce, uh, so I'll just stick to TPP-11 because it's easier to uh, say. And then uh, I'll explain uh, about Japanese leadership in forming this uh, trade group uh, and conclude. Okay, so uh, Ken Calder, who used to be actually um, a former colleague of mine at Princeton, uh, called Japan uh, a reactive state. Um, uh, he didn't call it a passive state because he didn't want to overemphasize the passivity. Uh, so he chose uh, another word called reactive. Uh, but uh, for Japanese, you know, we, we, we had this history of uh, Marxism and then uh, reaction to it. So reactive always reminds us of re reactionary, <laughs> but uh, reactive is 
much more neutral than, than reactionary. Uh, so two there are two elements in this reactivity uh, of Japanese behavior. One is uh, passiveness or passivity. That is, we always wait for the initiatives from outside, uh, typically the U.S., but not necessarily the U.S. We just wait for our partners to make the first move and then react, <laughs> right? So that's why we are reactive. Uh, so that's one first element in, in this reactivity. But the second, which is somewhat paradoxical, is that uh, we are also flexible. Uh, Japan is flexible in the sense that uh, we are willing to make compromises. Uh, and, uh, you know, my uh, wife uh, raised two kids and, uh, you know, raising kids is uh, no easy task, <laughs> as you, some of you may know. And she always emphasized, you have to make a compromise, <laughs> right? Uh, because kids always <laughs> demands a lot of things. And so her first lesson for, for our kids was, how to make a compromise. And I guess if Japan was raised by her, sh Japan would be a model student <laughs> because we know how to make compromises. Okay, so um, this uh, characterization of Japan's behavior, is ex especially external, external uh, Japanese behavior, uh, has been confirmed and reconfirmed by various studies. So I just uh, mentioned two studies, uh, one by Mikanagi. Uh, Mikanagi-san actually is a former student of Ken Calder's, so you know, if you're a student, <laughs> it's hard to <laughs> go against your mentor, but uh, she affirmed certainly that uh, a Japanese trade policy is uh, reactive in, in Calder's sense. And Miyashita, uh, uh, who studied uh, at Columbia, he f looked at uh, Japanese foreign policy, uh, I'm sorry, uh, foreign aid policy, and also found the same elements, uh, pass passivity and flexibility in, in, in Japanese uh, foreign aid policy. So at least in these two domains, it's been confirmed that this theory works. Uh, However, uh, Miyashita san, who's a good friend of mine, also um, slipped in a very important point in his book, in his, uh, in his work. Uh, that is, um, and it's very short. <laughs> it's in a footnote, <laughs> actually. It's not in the main text. Uh, but he says that Japan can be very proactive in the absence of U.S. pressure. That is, if there is no U.S. pressure to do this or to do that, Japan can be very proactive in, uh, in foreign policy. So uh, I wanted to credit him for, for this hypothesis. So I will call this a Miyashita hypothesis or uh, to take one element from his hypothesis, I'll call this situation of non-existence of U.S. pressure uh, a Miyashita condition. <laughs> and I'm sure Miyashita-san should be very glad <laughs> that he has his name on a very scientific theorem. Okay, uh, so, um, Th this will appear later in my, in my talk. The, um, now, as soon as his article, original article, uh, to explain this uh, reactivity uh, appeared, Japanese behavior began to change. <laughs> so you have to be careful when you publish, <laughs> right? Uh, your results may change very, very fast. 
Um, so in the early 1990s, um, there were some signs of change, right? So in, uh, to, uh, to put it maybe too simply, uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, Japanese were very passive and also, you know, deferential to, to the U.S. But then in the 1990s, there were signs of resistance or recalcitrance, I, I prefer to use this word. And this was discovered by uh, someone called uh, uh, Len Shopper. And in his book, uh, he already um, sort of narrated the, 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 the signs of Japanese resistance. But in the later, in the later work, he explained why this happened. Um, so, uh, oh, by the way, uh, Japan that can say no. This is a, this is a famous book uh, written by uh, Akio Morita and uh, Shintaro Ishara. Um, so that that was sort of uh, symbolic or uh, uh, of the of the mood of Japan at that time, because after years years and years of U.S. pressure, you know, Japanese got tired of U.S. pressure, <laughs> so we. We sometimes, we, you know, we just wanted to rebel. <laughs> so this book, you know, basically uh, symbolized the Japanese mood at that time. But you know, it, it was reflected in uh, in its uh, trade policy too. Um, I won't go into detail, but uh, the the facts uh, that led to this resistance or recalcitrance were threefold. Uh, according to Len Shopper. One was the end of the Cold War, right? Uh, during the Cold War, we were junior ally of the U.S. and we were protected by the U.S. nuclear umbrella. Well, we are still <laughs> protected by the U.S. nuclear umbrella, but, you know, especially during the Cold War. Um, the, so in that kind of situation, it was very hard to rebel against the U.S. in any kind of uh, situation. So with the end of the Cold War, that, that pressure was off, at least for a while. Uh, so that's one reason. Another reason was the um, WTO, World Trade Organization, was uh, established in 1995. And some of you who don't know anything about trade may think that the WTO is the same as its predecessor uh, called GATT. Uh, but there is one important uh, difference. That is, GATT had no strong dispute settlement mechanism. There was a little bit of uh, provision for that, but you know, very, very soft. But the WTO had a very robust dispute settlement mechanism where they can adjudicate interstate trade conflicts in a very uh, uh, forceful way. Um, so in other words, Japan from now from now from that time on, Japan could utilize the WTO to settle trade disputes with the U.S. Uh, in a more impartial uh, way. So that's another reason why it became more resistant to U.S. pressure. Okay, the third reason is uh, it's more general, but uh, there was a loss of trust between Japan and the U.S., especially in the trade domain, because um, there were some episodes where the United States uh, sort of uh, expanded their demands in the, in the middle of negotiations and uh, in the end they they just blamed us for transgressions that we really didn't commit well at least at least Japanese thought we didn't commit uh, so there was a very uh, sudden loss of trust uh, among our trade negotiators toward the US 
So um, for these reasons, uh, Japan became much more resistant to U.S. pressure, especially uh, the kind of pressure we thought was uh, unreasonable. Um, so uh, this was one big change in Japanese external behavior, which went counter to, to, to Kent Calder's characterization. Okay, uh, next change was, I, I already mentioned this, uh, that is um, Japanese became much more aggressive uh, at the WTO, uh, especially in dispute settlement. And uh, again, another uh, good friend of mine, uh, Saudi Pekinen, uh, characterized this as, you know, sword and shield for Japan. The WTO became a sword and shield for Japan, especially sword in the sense that not only we can be pressured by the U.S. and we use the WTO um, as a shield to fend off U.S. pressure, but also we use the WTO, we began to use the WTO as a sword to, to fight against the U.S. Uh, violations of WTO rules. So um, again, that that's you know that's not in the in the textbook <laughs> of uh, Kent Calder. Uh, so therefore, uh, again, it was uh, recognized as a new element of Japanese trade behavior. We began to file a very great number of uh, WTO complaints against our major trade partners, especially the U.S. Um, so, uh, in other words, we, we were no longer passive, at least in this domain uh, of dispute settlement. Uh, but however, having said that, um, Japan still prefers compromises. <laughs> we are not like, uh, 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 you know, typical lawyer who wants to litigate no matter what, right? We just uh, use litigation as a last resort. And if, you know, if situation is uh, not too bad, we prefer to settle very amicably. Okay, um, so the last area uh, where uh, passivity or reactivity remained was in terms of uh, free trade negotiations, especially opening up uh, markets abroad. Uh, but here, even here, there was a uh, sort of uh, opening in the late 1990s. That is, uh, we began to be more proactive in forming FTAs or free trade agreements. So uh, we can pinpoint uh, 1998 as the year of uh, our FTA strategy. This was when uh, MITI, uh, uh, formerly known as METI, now it's called uh, METI, but uh, METI decided to be more proactive in uh, negotiating free trade agreements. Now I have to give you a little bit of background because Japan used to be uh, a great fan of the GATT WTO regime. Uh, in other words, GATT and then from 1995 onwards, WTO, we thought that was the best forum to negotiate uh, market access negotiations. That is, to open up foreign markets for our products. That's the best forum, right? Uh, that was our thinking. Uh, but that began to change gradually over time. Uh, because we found out that the WTO is not well equipped to promote free trade because uh, it, it's based on consensus. So it's becoming much more difficult to form a consensus among you know 150 or so 
members uh, at that time. It's, uh, it has more members now, but uh, it's, it's becoming very, very difficult to form any kind of consensus among this large number of countries. Uh, so, for example, the Doha Round, uh, which uh, started in 2001, it's still going on after 19 years, <laughs> right? Uh, so the, uh, it's, it's not working, at least as a forum of uh, trade liberalization. So we, we realized that and then decided that FDA was the way to go. So therefore, we became much more proactive. So to summarize, um, the baseline is this reactive state, but it, it began to change in various ways. So flexibility changed to more resistant in some cases. So that's the uh, shopper's argument. And also we began to be more proactive in some sense. Uh, so in dispute settlement, we are uh, adopting this aggressive legalism stance and possibly FDA may be going in that direction. So uh, now I'll shift my attention to FDA. Uh, in the 1990s, as I said, uh, Japan began to actively negotiate FTAs. And, the f and there were three FTAs we negotiated first. Uh, the first one was one with Singapore which uh, entered into effect in 2002, and the second one was Mexico. And the third one was one with South Korea, but uh, it was negotiation was suspended in the middle of uh, uh, some disputes. Okay, so um, I won't go into detail about these first FDAs, but my point about these three FDAs is, and, uh, and this is not uh, well known, that is actually the initiative came from these partners. Uh, Japan was relatively passive, right? As I explained before, the passivity in Japanese external behavior is that we, it's not that, that we, are willing, we are not willing to move. We are willing to move, but we'll just wait for our partners to make the first move, right? So in that sense, we were passive. Uh, because these three countries were very, very aggressive in their uh, FDA strategy. OK. Um, however, we learned a few lessons uh, from the first a uh, few FDAs we formed. And so therefore, we try to replicate this experience to other countries. So first, we try to uh, expand our FDA network to Southeast Asia. After all, you know, uh, after China, Southeast Asia is the most important economic market for us and also uh, export uh, platform. So uh, we began to form FTAs with Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, Brunei, Philippines, Vietnam. ASEAN is included, but that one's uh, a sort of a sort of platform rather than a substantive FTA. So um, I, I just put it uh, in there too, but uh, okay, so and also Japan concluded a few more FTAs with other countries. Uh, again, these are countries which we have very rel very close relationships or or uh, countries we needed um, help from Japan. Okay. Um, however, okay, so these uh, aside from. Uh, uh, aside from TPP and uh, RCEP, Nichuka, uh, CJK, uh, the, the, these are the countries that we formed our FTAs with uh, in the initial period. Um, however, 
So these two, there are four big ones that uh, we are uh, either negotiating or uh, just finished negotiating. Uh, that is EU, CJK, TPP, and RCEP. Right, so that's our next <coughs> topic. That is almost simultaneously in 2013, Japan started uh, four major sets of multilateral talks. So TPP, uh, and this is the original TPP which included the U.S. Uh, <laughs> because it was during the Obama administration. Um, and then the second one was uh, F our FTA with the European Union. And the third one is, again, very mouthful, <laughs> Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or otherwise known as RCEP. And the fourth one is CJK, or China, Japan, Korea, FTA. So uh, European Union, I don't know. I mean, European Union has uh, you know, 28 members, probably 27 very soon. But uh, uh, so I'll just call it uh, multilateral, because there are many countries involved. Um, but you may call it a bilateral FTA. Um, However, in these settings, Japan was not really proactive. Um, first of all, in the TPP, uh, the U.S. was very dominant. Uh, I asked uh, Michael Froman, um, she, he was the lead negotiator uh, in TPP during the Obama administration. Um, uh, I asked Michael Froman whether or not uh, he remembers any strong initiatives coming from Japan during the TPP talks, and he said none, <laughs> very bluntly. Uh, so, uh, in other words, you know, all the major initiatives, major proposals, major ideas came from the U.S. in TPP negotiations. Uh, Sad, <laughs> but true. Uh, okay, the in the Japan EU FDA European Commission was much more proactive than Japan, uh, and I would say pushy, <laughs> uh, very, very, uh, you know, um, aggressive in in terms of Japan US, EU. In RCEP. Uh, okay, there's a formal leader and a hidden leader. <laughs> the formal leader is ASEAN, the Southeast Asian grouping, because we honor something called ASEAN centrality. ASEAN wants to be in the driver's seat in any trade negotiations, so we honor that. You know, we pay homage to this principle. But in reality, <laughs> China is the leader in this negotiation. So uh, again, you know, uh, Japan is not really a leader in this. And CJK again, you know, China is much more uh, proactive than Japan. So, uh, uh, so for. One reason or another, Japan has not been uh, being able to exert any kind of uh, major leadership in multilateral trade negotiations. Right. So, uh, to to summarize, uh, <laughs> Japan started out as very passive in the first bilateral FTAs. We moved. Uh, we we uh, formed and then became gradually more proactive, uh, moved to, to this direction. But then in, in the last ba batch of multilateral FDA talks, we became much more passive. So uh, in that sense, you know, FDA can be called either passive or proactive. Um, Okay, so the, the final test 
for us is can Japan be proactive in multilateral trade talks? And uh, just to preempt my uh, conclusion, yes. <laughs> but you may want to know why. So I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, so the, the, uh, the U.S. Uh, under the Trump administration withdrew the U.S. from TPP in January 2017. Uh, we are quite saddened by this fact. Uh, but the remaining uh, 11 countries uh, eventually decided to form TPP without the U.S. Um, so the starting point was this March 2017 ministerial meeting in Chile uh, where uh, trade ministers gathered uh, and discussed what to do with TPP. Uh, there was no conclusion at that time. Uh, but one, in one important event happened at this meeting. That is, Japan was asked to lead the discussion uh, in forming TPP-11. And I'll come, be come back to that in a minute. Okay. Um, so because uh, Japan was asked to lead the, the, the negotiations for TPP-11, uh, Abe government sort of wondered, <laughs> you know, they, they discussed among themselves, you know, what to do. Uh, it took about a month, uh, but finally in April uh, 2017, the Abe government decided that, you know, we want TPP-11 and also we want to lead the negotiations uh, so that we will have something Japan wants. Right. So in July 2017, Japan hosted uh, a meeting in Hakone, and there all the important elements of TPP-11 negotiations were decided. First, we decided that there would be no change in market access elements uh, or tariff liberalization. You know, FDA, the point of FDA is to get rid of tariffs. So uh, that was uh, agreed to in the original TPP, and so we won't touch that part. Uh, that was one major element. The second thing we decided that, of course, we have to change uh, the, the rules for entry into force, uh, which I will explain in a minute, uh, because that was absolutely necessary. And then uh, we also decided to suspend or mothball some provisions in trade rules. Trade rules accept the uh, tariffs. Uh, uh, so, um, the entry into force. In the original TPP, um, the, it's very, very, very uh, unusual. But there was a provision saying that the countries which ratify TPP uh, 12, right, the original TPP, have to have combined GDP, 85% uh, of combined GDP of TPP 12. So combined, suppose that this, up, oh, sorry, uh, uh, the, uh, the combined GDP and U.S. was about 60% of that, and Japan was about 16% uh, and all the others. So, in other words, without the U.S., we'll never reach 85%, right? So, this provision had to change, right? Um, and here's a chronology of events. Uh, the important part in this is that we hosted a lot of meetings in, in uh, Japan. Uh, I'll show you pictures in a minute, but uh, we hosted a lot of meetings uh, and you know more than any other country. Vietnam hosted two meetings, which are very important, but you know other than that, each other uh, other countries hosted just one or none. So, uh, 
This is sometimes known as uh, Bashogashi Gaiko. <laughs> we just lend our space. Uh, okay, so here are some pictures from the negotiating round. Uh, and you can see that, you know, even with uh, 11 countries, uh, there are quite a few people <laughs> involved, so it's not, uh, not uh, you know, easy. Okay, uh, so in the TPP 11 negotiations, we called ourselves a leader. And one element of that is, uh, as I said, Bashogashi Gaiko. Uh, we, we lend our space to host a lot of negotiating rounds. Uh, but we did more than that. So we um, exped expedited the negotiations by, first of all, we aimed at minimalist option, which means as few changes as possible. And then uh, we also reminded other countries that time was important, uh, time was money. <laughs> and then also we prodded some laggard countries like Vietnam. So by doing all this, uh, we um, try to shorten the, the time of negotiations. So, uh, Japan guided the negotiation toward the minimalist position, which means that, you know, there are few necessary changes, but, you know, let's try to make them as few as possible. So, we simplified the modus of entry into force by just, you know, setting the threshold to uh, six countries or more, you know, don't worry about GDP or anything. Uh, also, no changes in market access, liberalization. Uh, also, provisions in trade rules. Uh, some of them can be suspended, but you know, try to make them to the absolutely necessary minimum, right? So, for example, we asked other countries to you know show their wish lists, but we didn't submit our own, right? In other words, we are not going to suspend anything. Uh, or we don't want to suspend anything, although there are a few provisions that, <laughs> that might hurt uh, Japan. Okay, uh, throughout the process, we kept on reminding uh, other countries that time was money. Uh, so uh, here are some quotes uh, from our negotiators. Um, and this was not all because, you know, time was of uh, the essence uh, inherently, because we were under pressure by the U.S. too. Because we were doing this bilateral negotiations called uh, U.S.-Japan Economic Dialogue in the first year of the Trump administration. And the U.S. was pressuring us to, to come up with actual tangible results in this uh, talk. Um, so uh, that was why. There are, okay, uh, and finally, uh, we, uh, we prodded Vietnam and Malaysia to hurry up. Uh, so for example, Vietnam and Malaysia were uh, late in submitting their wish lists. So we just reminded them that you have to, <laughs> you have to submit your wish list. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, we also made compromises. For example, with Vietnam, we sent our emissary to uh, come up with a compromise on their issue. So, um, it's clear that we took a very strong leadership role in TPP 11, but um, a more interesting question is why? And I just came up with three conditions uh, which, uh, which were important. One is request, uh, the second is consent, and the third is no objection from the US. Okay, just let me explain these in uh, very briefly. 
First of all, as I said in the March 2017 meeting in Chile, several countries asked Japan to take the lead, right? Specifically, Mexico and Singapore are very vocal about Japan being the leader in TPP 11. Uh, the reason, wh one of the reasons why they were worried was that Japan, for a purely domestic reason, Japan didn't send a minister to, to, this, uh, to this meeting. Uh, we sent a deputy minister to the chair meeting. So they, they suspected maybe there's something going on. You know, Japan really doesn't think seriously about this uh, TPP-11. Uh, so they were really making sure that Japan was in this together. And also Japan was, uh, uh, I'll show you in, a, in the next slide, that Japan is the largest economy in, in TPP-11, right? Suddenly, <laughs> we were the second largest, but now we were the largest economy in TPP-11. So they thought it's very na natural for the, the leading economy to be the leading negotiator in, in these talks. Uh, the second element is just as important as request. That is, we wanted to make sure that Japanese leadership was acceptable to all the members, right? Because if other countries were resisting Japanese leadership, it doesn't work, right? Leadership comes with followership. <laughs> uh, if there are no followers, there's no leader. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that everybody will follow. So for example, in, uh, just before the Toronto meeting in May, our TPP minister, uh, at that time he was uh, Nobuteru Ishihara. Uh, Nobuteru Ishihara called the Canadian um, trade minister and said, is it okay for Japan to be a leader? <laughs> Even though, you know, Canada was hosting this meeting in Toronto. Uh, and for, uh, for unknown reasons, it, Canada said, it's okay, <laughs> go ahead. Also in Toronto, we also made doubly sure that other countries were with us. So we gathered all the chief negotiators of Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and said, you know, we are going to be a leader in these negotiations. Is it okay? And they said, okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so that made up, uh, that uh, settled the issue. And finally, you know, there is a dog that didn't bark that is the um, United States uh, didn't object to this. That is, again, we made sure that the U.S. wouldn't object. So we sent uh, high-ranking officials to the U.S. to find out whether or not the United States was opposed to having TPP-11 and also Japan leading the negotiations. And, uh, you know, someone in the White House said, it's okay, go ahead. <laughs> so again, that gave us a uh, green light. So that's why that uh, Miyashita condition is very important uh, for this. So to, to summarize, uh, Japan for, for perhaps the, for the first time in post-war history took very strong leadership role in multilateral trade negotiations in TPP-11, and the reason was a combination of request and consent, and also the Miyashita hypothesis, if you could remember my friend's name. <laughs> Miyashita hypothesis was very important. Japan can be proactive without the U.S. pressure. Uh, so this was applicable in this case, um, but however, I'm a little bit uh, uncertain as to whether or not this is generalizable to 
all the trade talks we are going to have in the future. Because again, you know, you have to have requests and consent and no objection from the U.S. I just can't imagine asking China to say, is it okay for us to take the lead in this discussion? And China saying, yes, go ahead. <laughs> or India even. Uh, so it's the, all the conditions are uh, never easily satisfied or in other settings. So um, with, on that note, I'll conclude and then I'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, And my question is, mm -hmm. so um, you talked about India and for example, in terms of um, the economic scale, India is like a smaller country than Japan, not in terms of area or population. So like why would um, Japan be so, like, why, why, why is Japan so um, submissive and um, like why would Japan like kind of like it's, it almost seems like Japan didn't want to take leadership and you know because others kind of urged Japan to take the leadership they did that so like mm. why is that kind of like what's the reason behind that passiveness is it history um, is it like the kind of the special relationship between Japan and the US or mm. like mm. I'd like to hear more about that thanks shall I collect the questions or should I just uh, go okay uh, well thank you for your question um, Actually, if you read <laughs> Kent Calder's uh, article, you know he explains all the all the reasons why we are we are passive. But uh, um, let me start with with the general comment that you know Japanese are passive <laughs> in general uh, in our daily behavior. Yeah. You know we you know when you woke up. Uh, w when you wake up in the morning, I, I, the first thing we do is not to go out and change the world, <laughs> right? <laughs> we just check our notebook and, you know, <laughs> what's my next appointment? <laughs> uh, so uh, in general, you know, Japanese are passive people. So uh, it's no surprise that that's reflected in our diplomatic behavior. Uh, but again, you know, there are various reasons, both international and domestic reasons, why you know, we, we tend to be passive. And uh, the number one, uh, number one international reason is that the U.S. is so dominant and also, um, you know, they, they <laughs> either for egoistic reasons or for altruistic reasons, they tell us what to do. <laughs> in many situations. So, you know, we, we just became, you know, accustomed to taking, you know, orders from the United States uh, in, in post-war history. But again, you know, as I said, it, that's beginning to change. Uh, domestic reasons, you know, uh, it's hard to explain, but, you know, in Japan, there is a lot of gridlock in domestic policy making. So again, because of that, even if, you know, for example, if M Miti or Meti wants to do one thing, you know, other ministries say, oh, no, 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 don't do that, right? So they, they try to stop <laughs> Meti from taking strong initiatives. So again, for these reasons, it's very hard to, to be very proactive. Thank you. Please wait for the mic. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the relationship between South Korea and Japan is getting worse. Mm -hmm. And do you have any uh, direct, which way we are going? Which, which, which way, way the two countries are going? <laughs> <sighs> I knew this, this was coming. <laughs> uh, <laughs> First of all, um, you know, the uh, 
the current dispute uh, is very complicated, uh, but um, the the from Japanese point of view, uh, it started with this uh, Supreme Court ruling on um, forced labor issue, and the Moon government is co condoning the judicial branch of Korea to have a say on on this. And then, you know, uh, from Japan's point of view, it's contrary to what we uh, committed to in the 1965 treaty, uh, and therefore it should be reversed. Uh, so that's uh, the, the most important element in the current dispute from Japan's point of view. But, you know, the, later on it became, it spread to other areas and therefore it it became much more complicated. Um, so uh, which way the countries are going, uh, it's, it's, you know, you can speculate on what each country will do. Um, but for now, it seems that, you know, it's very difficult politically for either side to make you know, genuine compromises. So uh, I think the dispute will go on uh, for some time, <laughs> for some time. But uh, I think with the change of government in, in Japan in 2021 or, or Korea in 2020, uh, 2022, uh, probably it will be resolved in one way or the other. But before then, I don't know. I'm not sure. But I just hope that they can find a compromise somewhere uh, along the way. Thank you. Yes. Hmm? Ah, maybe you, you should. <laughs> you should be a leader. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Professor, for your um, inspiring talk uh -huh. and um, I just want to ask you about the uh, Miyashita condition mm. uh, specifically like uh, he wrote this um, uh, scholarly paper in the uh, 1990s mm -hmm. so uh, this uh, what uh, doesn't realize uh, at, at that time uh, didn't mm -hmm. realize mm -hmm. but like now we see this sort of theory um, mm -hmm. um, materialized mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. to, to some extent mm -hmm. And um, did he like uh, I I imagine the complexity uh, behind all these uh, nego negotiations? Also, like uh, what sort of factors behind, like say, I if Japan were to be a leader in mm -hmm. in, in the TPP, then mm -hmm. like what's um, um, the concerns on uh, both on Japan's side? Also, like. Uh, maybe some counter forces coming from the U.S., China, or um, Canada, uh, or wha wha whatever. Like, um, did he like include all this? No, um, no, 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 no. He uh, obviously he didn't anticipate all this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't the prophet or anything. Uh, uh, Miyashita wrote this, uh, as I said, in a footnote in in an article, and. Um, you know, he she pointed out that you know actually in some multilateral uh, lending practices, um, like ADB or you know even World Bank uh, negotiations, Japan was proactive. He he was looking at foreign aid, uh, not uh, not trade. So uh, he 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 has some examples in mind. It was, he wasn't just you know theorizing in a, in a hypothetically. Uh, but again, you know, he said that, you know, that's one condition. He didn't say that that was, you know, necessary and sufficient condition for Japanese proactivity. So he just suggested that, you know, that's one possibly a necessary condition for Japan's proactivity. Uh, but again, you know, he wasn't sure. So I, I'm just trying to, you know, uh, extend his hypothesis a little bit. 
you know, using TDP11 uh, ex example. Um, but again, as, as, as you said, you know, Canada could have said, you know, no, Japan shouldn't lead the negotiations because Japan could do something, you know, uh, counter to Canadian interests. Actually, I, I hope there are no, no Canadians in the audience, <laughs> but, uh, you know, Canada was a very tough negotiator in TPP-11 negotiations. We had a very hard time, you know, uh, persuading Canadians not to change this or that in, in TPP. Uh, so, um, so, I mean, it, it's a miracle that Canada accepted our leadership. <laughs> Yes. So, so I'm Canadian. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> I think it's interesting because Canada also has um, a position with the United States that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Japan also has a very right, close right, right, position. Right, right. Sure, sure. Both, both used to. So I'm just wondering, is if the United States, if we cons could consider as becoming a less reliable mm. trading partner, mm. are then are is what we need from places like Canada and Japan a more reliability is that the kind of is that why everyone Canada and Japan being so careful to step up and be proactive mm. it's because we're trying to keep the rules-based system mm -hmm. a reliable one mm -hmm. yeah. okay uh, thank you very much um, yes we um, um, you know, in trade, we always say that the you know predictability is very important uh, because businesses engage in you know long-term contracts, long-term investments, which you know uh, bear fruits in a very long-term perspective, and therefore you know if you know policy keeps on changing or rules keep on changing, you know, it's very hard to adjust. So therefore, you know, we need some kind of stability or predictability. And certainly the current administration in the U.S. is not making it easy for the system to be predictable. Uh, we don't even, for example, you know, uh, I didn't talk about this in, the, in my presentation, but one of the uncertain elements that's hanging over us is that the uh, the appellate body in the WTO. This is a very important organ in in the WTO, which makes this dispute settlement work. Uh, it's going to be dysfunctional from December on, so we don't know what is going to happen to this dispute settlement system from that point on. And the Trump administration hasn't given us any assurance as to where this is going. Uh, and uh, uh, so therefore, you know, uh, predictability is, is a very scarce commodity in, in, in the current uh, situation. Of course, we, like Canada and, the, and Japan, who are you know, less influential than the, uh, than the United States, have to basically resort to soft power. <laughs> In other words, we have to keep on arguing that you know, reliable and predictable trading system is uh, important. Of course, market access is important, but uh, you know, uh, just as important as predictability in the system, and therefore, you know, uh, everybody should strive for that. Uh, and I'm sure that you know a lot of people in the U.S. accept that argument. It's just that the you know that argument doesn't reach the highest level <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> I wanted to hear you talk a little bit about special interests and producer mm -hmm. groups in mm -hmm. Japan. So I was thinking, mm -hmm. just in comparison with the U.S., 
Yes. Uh, one explanation for why the U.S. has been a proactive state is that there are proactive producer groups and individual firms mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that are really active and interested yes. in, in trade politics, and they push really hard. They have a problem with market access or intellectual property yes. rights in some yes, market, yes. and they push hard to get it resolved, maybe through an agreement or maybe in some other way. And so maybe you could talk just a little bit about what um, producer groups and individual firms mm. are doing in Japan, and mm -hmm. do they have the same sense of, of being reactive, and how do they feel about that? Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, as you said, that the you know producer groups or uh, export uh, groups are very important um, in any kind of uh, trade talks. Uh, they are the push. They are the people who are pushing for uh, greater market access and. Uh, uh, trade liberalization and also rule rule harmonization and so on and so forth. Um, so in Japan, those are major uh, export firms uh, like autos and machinery and uh, machine tools industries, uh, and they they are the sort of dominant voice in our industry called industry group called the Keidanren. So Keidan then, you know, pushes very hard on, on the Japanese government to, you know, uh, assure market access abroad. And also, you know, for, for us, investment is becoming more and more important. So, you know, we, we also uh, want to create an open environment for our uh, foreign investment. Um, so, um, why it this doesn't lead to proactivity? <laughs> Again, that's a, that's a good question. Um, a, in terms of the special interest groups, you know, there's a counter force. That is, uh, our agriculture is very uh, non-competitive, <laughs> or or um, so they are always opposed to trade liberalization. Because trade liberalization, as far as you know, it's uh, as long as it's reciprocal, right? Uh, if they open up their markets, we have to open our markets, and whenever we open our markets, uh, food, <laughs> farm products uh, start coming in. So uh, they are always opposed to trade negotiations. So they always push. Uh, the government not to engage in any kind of ambitious trade talks. So Jiminto uh, or LDP, who, who's the party who who relies on the support from both uh, big business and farmers, <laughs> you know, sort of they they have a split personality, right? So one one faction or one set of people. One liberalization, one set of people, one protection. So uh, you know, <laughs> they don't know what to do. Uh, so that's one element in terms of special interest. But uh, having said that, uh, the current uh, Abe government uh, did some major reforms in not just in agriculture, but the um, the formation of this agricultural co-op groups and therefore uh, at least you know for now political power of the farm lobby is getting weaker and weaker so that's again that's one reason why we can be more proactive or pr aggressive in uh, trade talks these days thank you I, can I Oh, can I Go ask ahead. a two finger question sure. on, on <laughs> Ian's one? Sure. Um, so, so, and and this is this is a little going against your argument because yeah. I'm so arrogant, arrogant that I'm comfortable with being against my mentor. That's good. Um, <laughs> um, so, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm honestly a little skeptical that uh -huh. um, you know free trade is a popular policy in Japan. Um, 
So I, s I still remember oh. that the negotiation on TPP was going on when I probably, around the time I started, you know, graduate study in the US. Uh -huh. And I remember like a one the title of one book which says, TPP is going to destroy Japan. And and the, the guy who wrote that book is actually Meti official. That, uh -huh. that crazy guy is actually Meti official. <laughs> the book is full of, full of- Former, former Meti official. No, he's, he's actually current current oh, media official really? yeah he, he he went back to the medi from from kyoto oh. university or somewhere oh. um okay. I, I i know that uh, <laughs> but the the point the but that that book is is basically full of full of sort of mm. like obsolete statement yeah, like yeah, yeah. Like sure, sure. something something like dependency theory in 1980s or 70s oh. yeah. <laughs> and 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 so, so, and and also, you know, as you said, LDP is strongly relying on um, the the support from the agricultural yeah, industry, sure. which is far from decent. And I have, I can, I can complain about them for hours and hours. They 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 can't produce enough amount of butter, but they they won't protect their their market. Right. And so, something like that. And so, so I'm I'm wondering if this is about the leadership or this you if this is about like like. Free like attitude toward the free trade itself, and and especially about the TPP, it was it was the discussion in Japan that the TPP is is a system that is that is like a somewhat like um, um, uh, contentment of the China policy, and so I'm wondering if if this is you know if this is like within within the trade policy or if it if it if it if it is about like a trade policy mm, itself. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, of course, you know, um, <laughs> in uh, in theory, you can always distinguish between uh, you know preferences and strategies, right? In game theory, we say, you know, oh, this is the payoff function, <laughs> and here's the uh, strategy profile, you know, do this or do that in this node, <laughs> and so on and so forth. So we can always distinguish between you know, what you want and how you do it. Uh, but, you know, in reality, these things are all mixed. And as you said, you know, strategy may affect our preferences too. So. It's true that you know if we are protectionist, we should be pro, you know resistant. You know if we are you know pro trade, we should be more proactive, pro pro aggressive, right? So that's that's that. <laughs> but you know even giving given these preferences, which are basically you know every country has this problem. You know there are pro trade people and anti trade people, and you know. Somehow they have to make compromises, but even with that, you know, some countries decide to be very proactive. Some countries decide to be very passive, and you know, in most cases, it's it's a matter of power. I'm not a realist, but you know, whenever it's convenient, I use realism to explain. And Japan, you know, in a in a sense, has power because it's a big economy. So you know. We can certainly take advantage of power, and therefore we can be uh, more proactive. And uh, actually, that was the point of Kent Calder, uh, original Kent Calder article. That you know, it's puzzling that Japan is so passive, even though Japan's power, you know, so so high up there, you know, with other uh, major major countries. Um, so. Uh, so even though Japan has a lot of power, or at least latent power, sometimes we try to be, we can be proactive. We sometimes we are passive. So somehow political scientists have to know, you know, what are the conditions which decide, you know, which way we go. So I don't know if that answers. <laughs> So um, I'd like to um, contribute to the to, to support your larger theory that Japan mm. has become more proactive, but I'd mm. like to push back a little bit on like uh, the industries being so um, passive. And um, so I've done research on uh, specifically on mm. the um, geographical indications law, mm. and um, how <coughs> how the um, 
interest groups have slightly changed their policy, probably not like at a national scale. Mm. Um, so the thing about your question, like how the interest group um, influence policy, mm. uh, my, the research, uh, my research shows that, well, initially, as you said, um, you know, it's a large interest group and they're mm. very anti-free trade because it's not like competitive enough. Mm. But then, um, so the, uh, the MAF, the Ministry of um, Agriculture, Forestry mm. and Fishery mm. or mm. whatever order that was, um, they also had an initially, a, you know, an anti-trade policy, but then they slowly shifted into, well, you know, this trend is irreversible. So how are we going to actually, um, you know, use this to our advantage? Because we can't say, well, we don't mm. want rights, mm. we don't mm. want mm. whatever. Right, right. Yeah, right. So it's so this trend, like, also through the use of um, of GI geographical indications, um, it seems to indicate mm. that also there mm. are some um, industry groups that are interested in utilizing mm. geographical mm. indication mm. system, mm. for example, to export mm. um, high value added mm. products. So mm. that's, mm. Yeah. I hope that that's like where it's leading. But so in support of your thesis. Okay, thank you. Um, well, GI or geographical indicators uh, are an area that uh, I, I'm not an expert on. <laughs> so, uh, part of what I'm going to say is is based on uh, actual negotiations we had with the Europeans. Mm -hmm. uh, because beyond that, I don't know, uh, but. You know, the current Abe administration is sort of special in the sense that, you know, they are really emphasizing the export part of, of our agriculture. That is, you know, even though, <laughs> even though only 10% of our agriculture is really internationally competitive, uh, they are really trying to emphasize that some of our agriculture is competitive. Therefore, we should push to make this, you know, part even stronger, mm -hmm. right? So GI is involved in this too, because even though when we, you know, when we negotiated with the EU, you know, EU has tons of GIs, right? <laughs> like, you know, for fromage, you have hundreds and hundreds of GIs and, you know, they all wa want us to, you know, protect each one of them. Uh, and so we did. We promised, right, to protect even Camembert, which was offensive to the U.S., but <laughs> that's okay. Uh, but um, what we did is that we tried to persuade the Europeans to accept a lot of our GIs, like Yuvari Melon. <laughs> Yuvari Melon, I, I don't know if you have tasted Yuvari Melon, but it's one of the most exquisite melons in the world, but it's very expensive, <laughs> right? So I don't know how many Europeans can afford to eat uh, Yuvari Melon, but we persuaded the Europeans that U body is a geographical indicator, therefore it has to be protected in the EU area, and they accept it. So there are a lot of now GIs with Japanese geographical names uh, that are protected in the EU, mm -hmm. but not protected anywhere else, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, U.S. melon maker can you know, call their melon you buddy uh, in, in the U.S., but nobody's, you know, arrested for that. But uh, in the EU, from now on, <laughs> people will get into trouble if they start calling European melons you buddy melon. So, um, so, that, so, so my argument is that even some agricultural special interests are now supporting the Abe initiative because, yeah. uh, you know, it's good for them. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, one last question. Yes. So, so Professor Aida, you mentioned something that's very puzzling to me. You mentioned mm. how uh, during the TPP negotiations that Japan asked everyone to send in a wish list, mm. in which it, it had the opportunity to do so, but then right. it decided not to do that, uh. even though it's in leadership position, mm -hmm. even though mm -hmm. it has, like, all the power. Right. I just wonder why, like, 
it didn't do that even though there are provisions in the TPP 11 that would go against Japanese interests? Yeah, sure. Um, so just to give you an example, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, in the TPP, we agreed to extend uh, copyright uh, ex uh, to the deceased authors, <laughs> right? Uh, now it's 50 years after, after, the, uh, after the death of the author. Uh, now TPP extends that to 70 uh, years and the only reason we had that was that, that the United States wanted to uh, protect the copyrights of uh, Walt Disney. <laughs> uh, and certainly, you know, we have a lot, tons of Walt Disney products, not just books and films, but you know, everything. <laughs> uh, so certainly it's hurt, it hurts us, but uh, you know, we didn't want to, that clause to be suspended. Um, I mean, we, want, we wanted to suspend that provision, but we didn't push for it. Uh, the reason is very simple. You know, we are asking other countries to keep the changes to the minimum, right? We, as a leader, is asking someone to, you know, you know want less and less, you know. And then we, we say, oh, we want this much. <laughs> you know, that, that you know, undercuts our you know, uh, leadership. So I guess it was natural not to wish for anything. Uh, but again, you know, we could have gone the other way. So I, I think it was, it, was, uh, it was smart to do so in, by hindsight, but uh, I could have gone either way. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Um, please join me in thanking him again. Thank you very much.